you leave because they would just disappear after a matter of hours of hanging out with each other and then they would just disappear and I, I would call them wondering what happened where did you go and it wasn't until I'd had that experience a bunch of times that I realized wow these things I'm hanging out with people really late at night and that was that was the way to know for me like if somebody's here and it's two in the morning they're not actually here so that was a that was a pretty mind-blowing period of time because I remember trying to make four track recordings at that time and finding that I was completely unable to follow a musical idea from to its completion uh, but as far as experientially what was happening during that period of time as far as my experiences listening to music and uh, having feelings and I don't know if it was communication with people's astral bodies or hallucinations. I'm not sure what it was, but it was very real. And I remember getting, uh, there There was a very loud voice in my head that said, you're going to be dead by your birthday. This is in December. And my birthday would have been four months later. And And the voice said, you're going to be dead by your birthday unless you get clean. And so I was pondering this, not sure, because... Throughout that year that I tried to be clean, the I wasn't. It didn't seem like anybody wanted to be my friend. It didn't seem like anybody wanted to really connect with me. It didn't seem like I knew how to interact with people. And so all of a sudden, that voice came saying that I was gonna that I was gonna die in a few months. And all of a sudden, all these things started happening that forced me into a position of having to get clean. Uh, I had several thousand dollars, probably six, seven thousand dollars in cash in my closet and that I would carry around with me. And uh, I went downtown to buy some drugs and I came back and the, well, no, the first thing that happened was the landlord came to my house, said he had to look inside my house. And I I said, I can't let you in because there was needles and blood and different things and it was a real mess even if it wasn't for the needles and blood it was just messy and disgusting and and uh, i knew he wouldn't be happy and so he said well if you don't let me in by tomorrow i'm gonna have to come here with the police and i already had a warrant out for my arrest because i'd gotten picked up downtown uh buying drugs but they let me go and i mean they let they let me out there was a court date coming in the future so that was the first thing I did was I got everything I needed out of that house and had had a, an acquaintance drive me to a hotel. And then I had that six or $7,000 and came back from buying drugs and, and the money just was gone. I had no idea where it could have gone. I, my best bet was that somehow I lost it in the taxi, mm. but that was all the money I had. And then Bob Forrest, the friend of mine, put me on the phone with Bob Forrest and he said, I can get you in a clinic to to get off drugs. You can do it however you want. You know, uh, I, I told him I'm not addicted to anything. I don't need I don't need pills or anything. And uh, he said, if you don't want to take them, you don't have to take them. Like you need to go in there just to reset your mind. And and uh, I really had no choice. I mean, it would yeah. would have been between that and just being a bum on the street, you yeah. know, like moving into a tent or something. Yeah. And so I did it. And and this for the first time, I tried a few times to get off drugs, but this time, I had a I had a feeling for the people who were there. I instead of arguing about the wisdom of being completely clean and admitting yourself an addict and that means you can't ever take anything instead of arguing with this stuff i really tried my best to help the other people who i was in there with and by some weird fluke like dh the original drummer i played in the band with wound up in the same uh hospital with me at the same time and yeah so i i just felt this empathy for the people that i'd like I thought, regardless of what happens with me, like I want to, I don't want to mess up anybody else's experience here because they're all, they've all been having a harmful effect on their loved ones and people around them. And like, I'm not going to say anything to, to argue with their attempt to better themselves, you know? And yeah. so, yeah, so I went through that, that 30 days and that was December of 1997. And, 1998 turned out to be really productive year. The first few months, again, were really boring. I didn't feel good inside myself. And I feel like, especially nowadays with the internet and stuff, people forget 
how valuable it can be to just be really bored, you know? How, Absolutely. How valuable it can be to to realize I'm not comfortable in my body, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, to realize I have no ability to communicate with people, you know, uh, f- to push yourself and to try to get better at, at, at listening to people and talking with people and having fun with people, all that stuff, like to actually have to make an effort for it not to be able to just be some automatic thing you can do by saying something you think is witty that you don't actually see the the reaction to, you know? Yeah. And yeah, so I had several months that were really boring, and then I think other people, you know, saw me as being at a really good place, and before I knew it, they asked me to be in the band again, and we started Incredible. writing Californication. Incredible. How many years was it between leaving the band and coming back that time? I think about four and a half years, yeah. maybe five years. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like, I didn't know what I was capable of anymore, but it didn't matter. I think something had turned around in my head where I realized that making music wasn't about making music so you could generate these intense feelings within yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I was almost looking at it before at the blood sugar time as if making music was a way of creating a sort of a painting in my head or something, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, uh, Throughout those, all those years, the music that I really felt strongly about, like those people I just mentioned and Jane's Addiction and The Germs and David Bowie, the things that really meant something to me for music, it felt as if those people were giving me their friendship. It felt, it felt like, the, like when I was alone, they were my friends. So I, I think I had it in my head that I suspected, and I wasn't sure, that making music can be a way of helping other people, a way of giving to other people, not taking yourself from the music. Y- that your own experience might be very bland, but you might have something in your soul that you can, by attempting to do something that you think is good, that you can give to other people that can function much like a good doctor does, where you're making people feel better. Mm -hmm. And those were the kind of ideas that were swimming around in my head at the time. And I had a lot of ideas. I had never regretted quitting the band during that five years, but towards the end of it, I started having these visions of what we could have done back in those days. If, if I had stayed with the band, what, what new musical territories could we have covered? You know, what, what, what new ways could we have combined that melodic aspect with the funk aspect and things like this? Because on that Blood Sugar album, it's it's kind of segregated. It's like there's the mellow uh, melodic songs and there's there's the funky fun kind of songs and and there's a little bit of crossover here and there, but mostly they're distinctly separate. And so I started seeing how the the two things could have fused together in different ways. And so when they asked me to be in the band, immediately I started being excited about, wow, that maybe those that music I was hearing in my head that was, you know, that was something that I thought was just something that could have happened in the past that never can happen again. Maybe it can actually, maybe I can actually do those things. And and we did them, and we were really ex- excited about them. So yeah. it, and once that album was done, and it did as well as it did, and stuff, and and it made people as happy as it did, it just like. It made me realize, yeah, it's true. Like, it doesn't really matter if you have, if you're blank in your head or if you have a ton of swirly, you know, colorful uh, scenes going on in your head while you're making music. That's not what it's about. It's about really connecting with the people you're playing with, supporting the people you're playing with, you know, writing music that you feel is somehow connected to the music that you really love, that means something to you, and to have that mindset of, wanting to share something with 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 the people that you're making music with and with the people in the world who might eventually hear it you know even as something as specific as going into the studio and playing a song together and getting a good take is a wildly exciting feeling yeah you know like when it comes together and you hear it really sound good i find it thrilling because a lot it doesn't always you know like sometimes you're playing it's like oh that's it's okay, but when it really does something beyond 
the regular. It's a very thrilling feeling being in the room and feeling it happen. Yeah, and there's something about that thing that we were talking about earlier that that I feel like you kind of infused on us where your object going into it isn't to have a premonition that that's the feeling you're going to get. You go in with a kind of a humility and a kind of an innocence, not knowing how it's supposed to sound, not knowing what it's going to come back sounding like. And yeah, so when you go in with that mindset of just being ready for whatever to happen, and then you realize you're really happy with what